Dr Fleming combines his PhD in philosophy and architecture, his experience in designing new towns in Singapore and his passions for writing and cycling to generate new concepts in spatial planning that revolve around bicycle transport. In the past year, he's presented his research to the government of Singapore, Boston Global Investors, community groups and institutes of architecture in New York, Singapore and Rotterdam. He is a regular visiting scientist at the Harvard School of Public Health, researching bicycle environments, and likewise uses his senior lecturer position at the University of Tasmania to lead bike-focused design studios and supervise PhD candidates in bike-focused topics. His latest work is with the National Museum of Australia and Professor Angelina Russo at the University of Canberra, investigating cycling in the cultural imaginary. Thank you very much, um, and thank you guys all for coming. Uh, all right. That's my book, which will be on sale in the foyer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll go through a, a couple of things um, quickly to begin with and then get on to a vision for the next 50 years, which is what I want to focus on. There's a lot of research in the economic benefits of cycling. This is being filmed. All the references are there. There are many more. Um, it's good for the economy. Uh, I, I'm very interested in what I call bicycle-oriented development um, as a kind of a supplement, augment, not augmentation, even an alternative to transit-oriented development. Uh, one example of this is in Minneapolis, where along the Greenway, the land either side of that has been rezoned for higher density, less parking. Um, and the developments that are going on, the developer infrastructure contributions are going toward that bicycle facility. So exactly the same sort of thing that you'd see with a Todd, only you can get on and off at any point. Uh, I like the idea of bicycle oriented development, even in Holland, um, where these figures come from. Um, People don't actually like getting on the bus or the train, and that's in a country where um, trains are mainstream. But you can see with the green bar there that people do like cycling, and of course they even like driving. Um, so transit is kind of a fearful model. Um, it's not meant to be, we all wish it wouldn't be, but it's also obesogenic, unfortunately. Um, now I do work with the Harvard School of Public Health, um, and they've done large um, epidemiological studies looking at thousands. One particular study looked at thousands of women going through menopause and found that the ones who cycle regularly were controlling their weight, whereas the ones who were walking regularly, and that's what transit-oriented development encourages, a, a 400 to 800 metre walk to a train station. Um, that's because walking doesn't actually increase your metabolic equivalent of task. You're at one at the moment, sitting there, walking, you're three, walking upstairs, you may be eight, cycling, you may be eight. Okay? So the more met hours we accumulate, the more we control our weight into middle age. Um, now, I think this is an important agenda for architects because what architecture does is it makes people live longer. Um, the building code of Australia, the equivalent in America, um, insists that we have toilets and basins inside. You can't just go outside to the toilet to wash your hands if you're a germphobe. Um, you're kind of made to live longer by controlling infectious disease, and that's what architecture does. Um, study work I'm doing at Harvard, we are actually working on a paper to uh, recommend that um, building codes insist that bike parking in offices, the sort of stuff that we've just heard of in residential, putting the bike in the equivalent of the position of the basin where you kind of can't leave home without it, you have to sort of ignore it. Um, now, is that practical or not? We'll leave that to architects. Maybe the code writers will get there. A um, couple of current best practice things to look at now. The picture on the left is current best practice. We want barrier protection. Um, we, want, we, we want to say that there's an emphasis on behaviour as a consequence of culture, but actually behaviour, we say as architects, is a consequence of the environment. So we want to design bicycle environments that encourage cycling. Um, and the research shows, and there's tons of it again, that a barrier protection in Sydney, God bless, is Australia's only real bicycle city. Melbourne's starting to catch up, but you guys are, are actually getting there, which is fantastic. Barrier protection, two, two and a half times more popular, um, and also, depending on whose stats you look at, maybe ten times safer than riding in a door zone where someone on their mobile phone might collect you. 
Um, another little thing I'll throw out there just as a little take home as well. I was in a conference in Seattle recently and I was really impressed by these guys' biz cycle. The local bicycle advocacy group have an accreditation scheme where you can get platinum certification for your business to say that it's a bike friendly business. And they are becoming the drivers of um, property. Um, they're pushing the property developers to put in the bike facilities. And they're even, to get their platinum certification, they have to push government for infrastructure. Um, there's also a big trend in America for business districts which can't get customers otherwise to brand themselves as bike friendly. Okay, now this is what I really want to talk about. If you happen to be one of those sad people who follows my blog, um, I put it up as a blog post. Um, if you're anything like me, you need to hear things twice before you understand it anyway, so you won't be disappointed. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit more, but the coming age of urban expansion, as a product of these things, we're having population growth. Australia's population in the next 100 years is pegged at about 60 million. Um, our cities are going to double in size, basically, and they can't keep sprawling at the edges. Some of the smaller cities will grow, but cities like Sydney, as we've heard, are going to grow. And a lot of that's going to be taken up by brownfield development. And I want to know, is there an opportunity to base that brownfield development on a bicycle mobility platform? Okay? Not a bit of bikes on the edges, not a bit of transit on the edges, but actually a bicycle mobility platform. Not because I hate cars, um, but because I don't think bicycles ever, since their invention a bit over 100 years ago, have had a chance to show their real power. Um, and I'm interested in that because I was in Boston recently and I was shocked actually that the big seaport area, which is like Darling Harbour here or any of these big brownfield areas, the car lobbies got in early and put money on the table at the feasibility stage study to make sure that the whole development would happen on a car-based platform. Okay, so the car companies are getting in early and keeping all of the other mobility forms out. Um, so, and that's a hotly contested site. All right, now, uh, a bicycle mobility platform might seem a little far-fetched for our sore little legs and our soft derrieres. Um, consider, though, how people in the 1920s and 30s might have thought of the idea of a car-based mobility platform. People in the 20s and 30s couldn't afford cars. Um, they looked at the countryside and they thought, there's no way we can live out there. It was an absurd proposition. Uh, especially for working class people. Um, <laughs> kind of as absurd then as it is for us now. I'm going to show you lots of photos of this thing here called the Futurama, which was an enormous exhibition at the 1939 New York World's Fair, um, which people visited. 28,000 people a day filed through this thing. I've been getting into the archives, I've been out to the site, I'm really interested in this exhibition that in fact changed the world because people saw this just before World War II. Um, it was sponsored by General Motors. It was a world designed around cars, shrinking space time, all of that country side, the mountains could all be brought into within a half hour driving sphere. And then America went off to World War II and came back and our grand my grandparents' generation, not actually my grandparents, but their generation, tried something new, tried something that had never been tried before called suburbia. Um, after World War II, they raced out and they actually built this fantastic vision that they'd seen, an untested vision. Uh, and that was largely due indirectly to the influence of a lot of architects, utopian dreamers, visionaries. Um, now, if we look too closely at a lot of these utopian visions that inspired urban sprawl, you start to wonder if our ancestors didn't go too far with plans that were actually meant as a joke. Um, Le Corbusier, for example, you know, what a comedian. Did he really think that all of the land of Paris could be compulsorily acquired um, and built with towers and freeways down the middle? Uh, <laughs> Now, this guy was seriously joking. Um, this is Frank Lloyd Wright's Broad Acre car. <coughs> it looks a little bit funny. <laughs> yes. 
Um, okay, but what about, the, what about the one that actually changed all of this, um, the Futurama exhibition? Now, as postmodernists, we're taught, you know, I was brought up um, to be cynical of these shared visions. Postmodernism is sceptical of shared meta narratives. We're not all to be walking hand in hand into the future together. Um, we're pluralistic. So from a postmodern perspective, we look at this and we see the same old cornball circular cities that everyone from Plato to Walt Disney thought they could build but actually couldn't. Um, we also see cars that Hot Wheels wouldn't even produce these days. They're so absurd. For those of us, I know Gus here has sat through this 23-minute video and transcribed it for me. <clears throat> if you watch this on YouTube, um, to New Horizons, it has this sort of voice by a narrator who took diction lessons from God. Um, and people in 1939 fell for this nonsense. Um, they actually did. Now, we think that they must have just been idiots. You know, our grandparents just weren't as well educated, they weren't as intelligent as us. Um, that's because we look at all the utopian visions that have failed, you know. Does um, Paolo Soleri really, did he ever th think that Arcasani would get off the ground? That's like 2% complete. Um, this guy Jacques Fresco, he's in his late 90s now, but he still dreams of a day when no one will have to do any work because it will all be done by the machines that build these buildings. Um, but there's a difference between the Futurama and these visions, and that is that the Futurama actually came to fruition. There were many differences. The 14-lane freeways for 150-mile-an-hour travel got shrunk down to eight-lane freeways for 70-mile travel. Um, and the fantastic Googie-style buildings became what the Venturis call decorated sheds. Nevertheless, America did return from World War II elected President Truman, and then set about building the freeways and sprawls, just as they'd all seen at the exhibition, and Australia followed suit. Um, now, by today's measures, the Futurama is a disaster. But let's not forget that the good highways did reduce road deaths, and energy back then did seem as though it was infinite. And also, people back then had good reason to want to spread out. You know, it, most of them could remember 1918, um, when influenza had killed one in 20 people. So they did actually want to spread out. So we shouldn't be measuring their vision by the standards of our um, concerns today, which are, what, what are they? War over oil, um, global warming, social isolation, obesity, and so forth. We can't blame them when, as architects, we haven't provided a new dream. People today who want their big house and want their car are still working with the last great dream that's been provided. Um, grabbing yourself a house in the city and saying that the plebs had their chance when the prices were low is not very helpful either. Um, so I believe it is our responsibility as designers to come up with a plausible and useful dream for the future. <laughs> okay, so urban growth um, for the rest of this century is going to be largely focused on brownfield sites. Um, so what are they? Docklands, landfill areas, old factories, dumps, gas works, etc. How will we develop this land? If we were having the conversation in the post-war era, we'd be talking about towers in a park, um, but we all know that the parks quickly turned into car parks. If we were having the discussion in the 80s, we'd be influenced by um, what was called the urban design movement. It came out of the 1956 um, conference at the Harvard School of um, Graduate School of Design, uh, where people like um, Sirt, Jane Jacobs, um, Gordon Cullen, Kevin Lynch, and the poster boy for low rise, high site density um, development, Jan Gale, um, this was their ideology and it was focused around the pedestrian. Um, and we would have designed buildings in the last development boom of the 2000s um, in the model of Paris, just with new style buildings. That didn't happen, though, because architects spent the 2000s paying lip service to urban design principles, but actually serving ultra-conservative financiers, sorry, AMP, um, <laughs> who insisted apartment buildings have enormous garages. Okay, two cars per, every architect knows this problem, two car parking spaces per unit or you don't get finance. Um, now, why is this? I can answer this in many ways. Stefan van der Speck, a colleague of mine at, U um, at TU Delft, in Rotterdam, or sorry, in Delft, but near Rotterdam, um, attached 
tracking devices to uh, empty nesters, uh, condo developers who live in Rotterdam. And he found that they spend next to no time in the city centre. They just jump in their um, lifts, go down to the car parking basement, shoot out like Batman and go to the same old shopping centres that they know from the times when they raise their kids. That's the sort of apartment development that's happened all over the world. Now, without instant car access to suburban shopping malls, national parks, beaches, IKEA, mountaintop lookouts and Hoover Dam, we know a person will die within a few months. <laughs> OK, we don't actually know that for sure. <laughs> but at the same time, we don't want to build apartment buildings without car parking and find out the hard way, right? Um, in architecture courses and urban design programs, and I'm an academic, so I know about these, um, we talk about contemporary development patterns in terms of exemplary notions, for example, towers in a park um, or European typologies. Um, it's a pity neither of those models has ever had a huge knock em dead expo pavilion built um, to explain them, um, with 28,000 people a day passing through them with bottomless sponsorship from General Motors. To understand the impact of this um, exhibition, you need it was a one acre sized diorama. Um, number one attraction at the New York World's Fair of 1939. People saw it as though from a, a low-flying aeroplane. They sat on these chairs which were attached to something like a luggage conveyor at the airport which moved slowly through this whole thing with the voice speaking to them. Uh, and they, it was fantastic. And they popped out the other end. There have been novels written about this, um, one called The World's Fair. Um, it's no wonder people were convinced. It was an incredible exercise, a utopian vision, fanciful but kind of realistic enough. We think of the suburban houses and the suburban buildings, but it also showed urban buildings, buildings in the city centre, which are very much like the ones that we're building at the moment. Um, apartment buildings, mixed-use buildings with big car parks underneath that are perfectly connected to the freeway system. Um, if you look at these, it makes you think that all of our talk at the moment about transit-oriented development, ecologically sustainable development, walkable neighbourhoods and now bike-friendly development is kind of just a bit of a veneer. Um, because actually what we're very good at building is the Futurama vision. Uh, this is Rem Coolhouse in Rotterdam. The only difference is, is that Bel Geddes put the car parking where you could see it. Uh, we like to camouflage it. And we're very good at that. OK, why should it bother me as a cyclist if all this car infrastructure goes in behind? Surely cars serve a wider spectrum of society than bikes ever could. We're told, too, that driving is a user pay system, that motorists pay quite handsomely with their rego and fuel tax, car parking fees. And can't we design for cars in a way that doesn't impede upon cyclists? Well, I don't agree with any of those assumptions, so let's work through them. First, car-based urbanism only properly serves drivers, which means people with good eyes and good health who are over 18 with about $5,000 a year to burn. Um, it's just as well that you are allowed to get a little bit tipsy, park on footpaths and bike paths, um, occasionally go over the limit, um, do all of those kinds of things, or else all of us would be excluded from a car-based society as well. Um, Give me a bike-focused city any time. There aren't very many of them. Groningen in Holland, maybe. Um, and those cities show us that it's about people anywhere from 8 to 80 with no money at all can participate in a bike-focused society. I certainly don't agree that it's a user-pay system. You can talk about road tax all you like, but no one is actually paying for rent of public space, the road. Um, a car takes up about 100 square metres of that. When it's moving along, a bike about five and a pedestrian about one. So let's just put it out there that we'll all pay by the hour for the space that we use in the city. I can pay a dollar an hour for walking, five dollars an hour for cycling, and this guy can pay a hundred dollars an hour for driving because we're paying. That's a user pay system. You know, we talk about the tar road tax. What is that? That's just a compensation for the externalities. Now. <laughs> The real problem with cars, though, is that they slow cyclists down. <laughs> and I don't mean that as a man bites dog kind of ironic pitch for a headline. I'm serious. Commute times in cities um, <laughs> were shorter 
um, when bikes set the pace and were shortest of all in cities with no um, cars whatsoever. Um, why is that? That's because the effective speed of cars in Canberra, which is a great car city, is 13 kilometres an hour. London, it's about eight. I've seen some figures that some parts of Sid Sydney, the effective speed, which is the distance divided by time, is three kilometres an hour. Okay, now everyone in the room knows that bikes can cruise along at about 20. Um, and in these bike cities, um, if we look at pictures of these bike cities from the 1940s, Copenhagen on the left, cycles, bicycles never stopped. Okay, they just kept up their speed and they filtered in turn. Um, introduced cars to that city, so look at China now, the bikes have to stop. So the fastest mode of transport has actually been slowed down. Um, and it doesn't matter how much you spend to try and fix the problem of driving, no one has spent more than Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, the average driver spends four whole days, four cycles of 24 hours stuck in traffic going nowhere, not even moving. And no one has spent more than them to try and fix this problem. So it's actually, it's an impossible mode. And wherever it's introduced, it buggers up a mode that actually works, and that's cycling. Not only that, cycling's healthy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now these people in Copenhagen, they were achieving pretty good speeds back then and they've been slowed down by cars. Copenhagen's not as good a city as it was. Um, they were doing that in a city designed for horses and carts with that sort of urban morphology that you see at the bottom there, narrow streets, um, taking lots of zigzags and also using crappy old bikes. Imagine the effective speed, this is where I'm going to sound, I am a utopian. Um, imagine the effective speeds we could achieve with modern bikes if cities and buildings were designed around cycling the way, for example, LA is designed around driving or the way, for example, Venice is designed around boats. Okay? Um, no such city exists. Let's take the basic knowledge that um, bikes can go at about 20 kilometres an hour. That's the green wave system in Copenhagen. Assumes that average speed in a flat city. And think about how far we could actually go. Um, the brownfields that we need to develop, and this is my mapping of the brownfields in Newcastle that aren't good for much anything else. Um, the brownfields that we need to develop in the next 100 years are generally flat, and they're connected by bulk haulage routes like rail lines and waterfronts, which are flat as well. So let's take those, um, let's have a utopian vision that says that we're going to use backdrafted, enclosed bicycle highways along all of the easements that connect these sites and somehow develop a new urban morphology for these brownfield sites that they connect, which optimises cycling. And that's what a lot of my work is doing lately. Um, this is just a basic typological, morphological study that I'm doing, taking the idea that you can raise up all of the buildings slightly on like Teletubby mounds, um, the bikes will flow underneath, they can take beelines in any direction that they want to go to. Um, and the apartments are designed overhead. This is a plan that I'm working on where we're just having access balcony, uh, access corridor up the middle which is wide enough to park bikes and it's a big long ramp. Um, if you look at it this way, all of the apartments ramp up from the top of these Teletubby mounds. The idea is that you're riding fast in the low point, you naturally slow down when you get to the top of the mound and that's where the entry or the shops are. And then you speed through in any direction to take beelines all across the town. You round all the corners because that's good for bikes. It's just a quick little model that I've done of it. Um, and so I, what I do with my work is I work through what does it look like to actually design around bikes not just fit bikes in. Um, and could this be an alternative for some of these brownfields, especially the ones that developers look at and they don't want to touch them? Um, and would we move there to live there, whereas at the moment no one wants to go and move it you know, to these places? If we design buildings in this way, a few fundamental changes. We wouldn't gather shops up together because we're not going to be walking between shops, we're going to be riding through them. So X is time, we can spread all of the shops around and put those on top of mounds, um, you know, and, and have people riding between. The nice thing about that is you can activate the entire district. You don't just have activated um, pedestrian shopping streets and then everywhere else is a mugging zone. Um, 
this idea of slowing bikes down, urban design studies of that. I like the idea that that's an exaggeration, but bikes can ride on a slope. Pedestrians don't like to walk there. So there's a nice way of shedding the pedestrians off of our space. <laughs> Um, and then fabulous students of mine. Um, a complete bike access apartment that's a big coil with all these maisonette apartments and the bike lane runs around the inside, go all the way up to the roof where there's a bar. <laughs> Speed on down, baby. <laughs> um, okay, so that's that one. This is precedented. There's a building in Copenhagen. A um, few of you might have been there, the Eight House by Bjarke Engels group where the bike access road goes all the way to the 10th floor apartments. Um, this guy, Bjarke Engels, I love him. Um, he's designing bike-focused buildings. Um, there are plenty around. This one on paper, this one on paper, the cube house in Rotterdam, you can ride all the way through. Um, and why not ride inside of buildings? Most bikes are still paying punishment for their forebears that used to piss on the floor, you see. And um, so that's why the Dutch, they just replaced their horses with bikes. We should be designing shops that we can bring the bikes inside of. Um, and if we do that, if we do that and we design apartment buildings that we can ride inside of or wheel our bikes inside of, mum can put baby down to sleep, or I can, go out and do some shopping and come back and baby hasn't been disturbed. There's a win. Um, <laughs> we cannot, in a democracy, increase cycling by punishing driving. Okay, it won't happen. Um, we can only increase cycling by incentivising it and making it better than driving. Rotterdam has got driving and cycling and only 15% of people cycle because they haven't really incentivised cycling. They've just got the infrastructure. They need to cover that infrastructure and they need buildings that you can bring the bikes all the way in to give bikes the competitive edge. Um, and so this is the kind of office building. One, a student of mine did this one, a, a spiralling office building where you've got a bike ramp around the inside and every workstation is designed so that your bike pulls up to your desk and the panniers flip open and are part of your workstation. And when you go to the toilet or the photocopier, you take the bike and you use it as a social bridge to chat. Well, gee, I like your new pedals. And we know as cyclists that bikes are conversation starters and in a knowledge economy, that's a really good thing. That's gold. Um, on the western side of a building, we want to reduce the heat load, so heat load, so maybe external bike ramps that take people after you come through a secure entry point to the outside of the building. Um, reduce the heat load and ride up to your workstation. Um, rounding the corners of the bottom of buildings seemed like a good idea to us. Um, keeping, maybe, keeping pedestrians and cyclists apart in shared zones. If there are going to be cars in these utopias, they'll only be underground. If they're, so Im if they're that valuable, if they're that important, pay to bury them. Um, otherwise, I don't think we need them. All right? I really don't think we need them. Um, yeah, uh, but you have lots of shared zones with cyclists and pedestrians. Um, and using cobbles or texture to provide a pedestrian refuge seems like a good idea. The Dutch do that as well. Um, and I love the serendipity of the current period in architecture where all the buildings, to my mind, as a cyclist riding around these brownfields, all the buildings there seem to be arcing and leaning and speaking to my point of view as an arcing and leaning viewer. Um, okay, I think I'll wrap it up just about. Yeah, <laughs> ding, ding. Um, okay, there was a lot of excitement in the 1920s and 30s by architects with cars. Um, we see this with Ecobusia, we see it. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, we've already seen it with Frank Lloyd Wright. They designed house and car packages. Um, and we're seeing something similar these days. Bjarke Ingalls teamed up with a bike maker, always photographed with his bike, designing bike-friendly buildings. Um, West 8 designing bikes. Um, Ron Arad designing bikes. These are part of the landscape treatment. There's a whole flurry of this stuff that most of it's just on the blogosphere at the moment, or some of it's realised. Um, buildings that really celebrate the bicycle in the same way that the Villa Savoie celebrated the car. Um, so final slide. We move, we always look for um, key yardsticks as architects, things that can inspire us and um, be touchstones of excellence. In the Renaissance it was the body, um, during the Enlightenment period it was the primitive hut, Logier's primitive hut. Uh, then we moved into the machine age, 
and um, some people say the European city occupies this space at the moment. That's what Anthony Vidler has said in an essay. I would love to think that at least for some of us in a pluralistic society, that the bicycle could occupy that space. Thanks.